If y'all go ahead and bring up my PowerPoint tonight, or this morning. Most of you guys probably know what those are. Right? What does that say to you? And for those of you that are watching by social media, there's a, there is a, uh, a picture up of a pair of boxing gloves. What does that speak to you? A fight. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I never, you know, as I grew older at least, I never did, uh, I never did quite understand the, uh, some people just like to fight to be fighting. I had friends that, that would, would fight at the drop of a hat and they would throw the hat down just to be able to get in a fight, you know. And I, I've been, I was in a scrap or two. I never was a person to back down from one. But at the same time, as I got older, I thought, you know, what, what, do you, what advantage does this gain you when you have a, maybe a black eye or a sore nose or, or missing a, teeth, a tooth or two when it's all said and done? But we all, we all realize and know that, that, that fighting is a part of life. For a boxer, it's a sport. It's a sport. Uh, for, uh, for some people, it's, it's a cause of freedom. For others, they just do it, I guess, because they like doing it. But, but, but even those of us that really don't like fighting, you know what? Fighting is a reality of life. It's a reality of life. Sometimes we have to, and I, 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 I said this uh, Wednesday night, and we're doing a series in, on Nehemiah on Wednesday nights until the 1st of March. And 1st of March, we're going to begin in a study of Revelation on Wednesday nights, just so you know. But, but, but we, we will fight for the things that we love. We will fight for the things that are important to us, like our family, for example. We will fight for our families. We will fight for, hopefully, for our country and our nation. And, and, and we will fight for our beliefs. And hopefully, they're the correct biblical beliefs. But, but we fight for those things that matter to us. But sometimes, it seems as though that the fight never ends. Have you ever, have you ever been in that type of situation? Where you feel like the, the, the ongoing fight, it just never seems to end. It never has seemed to cease in your life. Well, I've got a message to preach to you this morning along that line. And we're going to go to the book of Judges. And we're going to take a classic example. I don't prefer to call them stories because stories sort of, uh, you know, my, my mom never allowed me to say the word lie or call somebody a liar when I was a, a child. Uh, actually she we, I was taught that that was actually a curse word and I can remember on one occasion I called somebody a liar and I can remember my mom kept on the kitchen sink she kept a chunk of what is known as lie soap y'all know what lie soap is some of you and, and I can remember on one occasion that I called somebody a liar which in my mom's uh, my mom's ranking, vocabulary ranks, was a curse word. And I can remember my mama washing my mouth out with lye soap because I had called somebody a liar. So she taught us as kids to when somebody was telling an untruth to call it a story. So in my mind, when somebody says, I'm going to tell you a story, well, that might not be exactly true. Let me tell you this, this story, as a lot of people call it, but this account of Samson is, is a truth. It's not a story. It's not a fabricated event. And as we proceed with reading Judges chapter 16, now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate saying, our God, notice that has a little G by the way, our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands I'm going to pause here and tell you, Samson was an enemy because Samson, as we're going to learn a little bit more about here in this message this morning, Samson was a man set apart. And when the people saw him, they praised their God saying, our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. And while they were, and while they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson. See, Samson at this time had already been captured. 
Let me tell you what has happened to Samson. He's already been captured. He's already been tortured. And now, because as was the nature of, of, of that dispensation of time, they're bringing Samson out into an arena. They're bringing him out to be made sport of like a bull in a bull fight or, or uh, something of that nature. And they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. He didn't have a guitar strapped around his neck or stand behind a keyboard. He was there to be, they were there to watch him to be mutilated. So, Sam, so they called Samson out of the prison and he performed for them. When they stood among the pillars, when they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars. That's very important because at this point, Samson's eyes had been gouged out. Literally gouged out. Samson, put, put, me, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines was there. It was a, it was a big affair. It was a, it was a big event. And on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson to perform. The ones on the roof were actually beggarly people. So all of your dignitaries were gathered and beggarly people were gathered. And then Samson prayed to the Lord. He said, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please God. Notice that has a capital G. Please God, strengthen me just one more, one more, just once more, one more time, and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. And then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, and he braced himself against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other, and Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And then he pushed with all of his might and down came the temple on all of the rulers and all the people in it. And thus he killed more when he died than while he lived. I want to preach to you this morning along the thoughts of it's not over till it's over. Samson was a chosen man. He, he was chosen he was chosen by God, if you would. Samson was the product of an extraordinary conception. Manoah had a wife, and his wife is actually left nameless, and Manoah's wife couldn't have children. She was barren. She was unable to bear children. But yet, God promised them and God told them that they would conceive. And it, and it wasn't a divine conce uh, conception like uh, was the, the conception of Jesus Christ with the Virgin Mary, but yet it was extraordinary. It was beyond possibilities. It wasn't supposed to happen, but yet God gave Manoah and his wife a child. And he instructs them in that child. And he tells them that this child will be under a Nazarite vow. And understand with me this morning, we hear about Jesus being the, the lowly Nazarene, and we've read about that. And, uh, but there was a difference between the Nazarite vow and being a Nazarene. Samson being brought under the Nazarite vow, that meant there, there's two types of Nazarites according to tradition and historical documentation. There, there was one type of Nazarite vow where the, the person was enlisted for a specific tenure. In other words, a specific space of time. And then uh, they would have to abide by the vow under that specified time. Let's say it could be that, uh, that, that you were under a Nazarite vow for a year. And, and for that year, you had a commitment. There were certain things that you would do or that you would abstain from for that year. But then there was the Nazarite vow that was a permanent enlistment. And such was that type of vow that Samson was under. All the days of his life, Samson would be under this vow. All the days of his life, Samson would, would be set aside under a commitment of consecration. And understand me this morning, and I talk about consecration. There is a work that happens in, in the process of salvation 
that Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus, is what sanctifies me. In other words, it is what sets me apart. But there also, there is a work of consecration. And consecration is a work that you and I should be pursuing that in order to set ourselves apart. It doesn't, we can't be any more sanctified or justified than what the blood of Jesus makes us. But yet God calls us to consecration as well, setting apart in ourselves. So Samson has made this commitment, a lifelong commitment to consecration. The Nazarite vow was a voluntary vow. In other words, it's something that was, it was shown forth by a verbal decision. When Samson, Samson, at some point in time, Samson made a declaration that I will abide by this Nazarite vow. I will be set apart. You know, that's what Jesus is wanting us to do. He's wanting us to be set apart. He's wanting us, you see, when we, when we say that Jesus is Lord of our lives, then we are making a, a, a profession and confession in faith that we are going to be set apart for the work of the Lord and it means that we are going to be different. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we all have to, to, to appear really weird or anything like that, but yet when we consecrate ourselves to the Lord and we make Him Lord of our life, we are in essence saying that we are going to be set apart for the cause of the kingdom of God. We are so not necessarily supposed to be weirdos, but yet we are supposed to be different and we are called to be different, set apart, if you would, for the cause of Christ. And then, because Samson is a chosen man, there was an anointing that would follow Samson. Because Samson was under the Nazarite vow, the separation, the setting apart, there was an anointing that would follow Samson. Now let me tell you, I fully understand. God has used, he, used, he has used a, a, a prostitute. Actually, on more than one occasion, God used a prostitute. He used Rahab. Then he used Mary Magdalene, demon-possessed. I understand God used a crooked tax collector. I understand that God, God used uh, a, a murderer such as the Apostle Paul. I, I realize all of those things, and, and, and rightfully so, I understand God can and will so use who he chooses. But I do want to share with you a principle, a biblical principle that is given forth that as we yield ourselves over to God and as we consecrate ourselves to God, as we, as we yield and give ourselves to God, listen, there is an anointing that will flow. There is anointings that will begin to work through us. And when, when we fail, to give ourselves in obedience over to God and we fail to consecrate ourselves to God and we fail to allow God to use us. Uh, again, he can use whoever he wants, but it's a parody of sorts here. But God will use us more likely to use us. God more often will use us. God will more powerfully use us when we have given ourselves over to him in sanctification and consecration. So Samson, he's a, because he's a Nazarite, he's anointed. He's anointed. Samuel was also a Nazarite. He was anointed as a prophet. Samson is anointed, we, we see and we know, as a warrior. But at the same time, we know that Samson was a man of many failures. You know what? Every one of us in this room has failed. Everyone in this room will fail. You may be sitting in this room. In fact, and I'll, I'll go ahead and share with you. Uh, earlier this week, and I, as I was seeking God for this service, you know, early in the early part of this week, the Lord told me, taught, spoke to my spirit, and he said to me, there are people that will be sitting in that room Sunday morning that are dealing, that are trying to cope with failing. They're dealing, they're trying to cope with failures. There are people that need to be exhorted. There are people... And that, that, that is a large word of sorts, if you would. There are people that need to be encouraged. There are people that need to be lifted up. 
And though we know and understand that two wrongs don't make a right necessarily, every single one of us, and just like Samson, every single one of us in this room deal with failure. We deal with failure. We fail our, we fail our families. We fail our, our, our loved ones. We fail our employers. Sometimes we fail our church, and oftentimes we fail our God. We fail. We fail, and we, we have to deal with those things. You see, Samson was a failure because Samson first touched a dead carcass. He did a mighty thing when he touched part of that dead animal. But, 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 Samson, but Samson was under his Nazarite vow. He couldn't touch anything unclean. And, and a dead carcass, a dead animal was considered unclean. A Nazarite was under the vow, could not drink anything that was fermented and we know that if you study the scriptures and you'll find there in this story and that, that Samson drank strong drink. He drank fermented drink. We know probably in a more prominent way that it's apparent that, that Samson actually had woman, women problems. He, he, he had problems. He, 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 uh, he liked women and, and, and women would, could allure him. And, and we know ultimately it, it came to be his, seemingly be his demise that, that he lay his, his, uh, hat, head in the lap of a woman that was, what, that was deceiving him. And, and, and he revealed the secret of his strength as he laid his head in her lap. And we too have our failures. And we too have our weaknesses. And we too have our problems and our difficulties as individuals. But as Christians, and that people that were called to be set apart, and knowing that spiritual work of sanctification is going on in our life, and know there's a, there's a disciplined work of, of consecration that we should be pursuing always in our life. Even, even in all of that, that doesn't mean that we will never fail. But, but failures are not final, and we should be learning from our failures, and we should grow in our failures. But the struggle is real. The struggle is real. We deal with those things. We agonize with those things. We wrestle with those things. But you know, one of the th things that I've never really understood, but I can look back through years of my, my Christian life and, and in some of my, my, my failures and the episodes that I've had in my life where I miserably failed my church and I miserably failed my God and I've miserably failed whoever else might be around me. One of the greatest instincts that, that seems has overcome me and, but, but it is a fleshly instinct. It's a fleshly inclination to do is, is in that moment of failure, the thing that I chose to do was to go try to move far away from God. And that's the absolute worst thing and that's the wrong thing that we could do in a moment of failure. In fact, it's, it's in those seasons of failure, it's in those moments of failure that we should run to God and cling to Him and seek His presence and not, not divide ourselves from the church, the assembly of our, of our church family, but we should draw closer to our church family and, and we should draw strength one from another and we should encourage one another. So why in the world, I've often wondered, why do we, in the moments of weakness, in the moments of failure, why is it our tendency to separate ourselves from what is good? But yet we do that. And I can't answer my own question. I don't know why we do that other than it's just the work of the flesh. So the struggle is real. real, And we, and we fight in spite of ourselves. The Apostle Paul addressed this in his own life and Eugene Peterson in the message, a, a um, paraphrased interpretation of Scripture, U Eugene Peterson said this, quoting the Apostle Paul or paraphrasing the Apostle Paul. He said, I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Paul writing to the Romans, and he says, Yes, I am full of myself. After all, I have spent a long time in sin's prison. What I, why, what I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I end up acting in another way. I do things that I absolutely despise, Paul said. 
So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary for me. Understand what Paul is saying there is, you know, I want to do what's right. I want to do what I know to do is right. I, I, I purpose that I, I really want to conduct everything in the right manner, but I'm struggling to do that. So I come to this conclusion, Paul is saying, that what I've got to realize, what I can't do, that obviously the command of God, which is scripture for us, if you would, that the command of God is necessary. I need the word of God to lead and guide me in life and direct me in life because what I want to do is usually not the right thing. Thing, or what I end up doing is usually not the right thing. And then he goes on to say, but I need something more. I need something more. For if I know the law, but, the, but still can't keep the law. The law's the word. If I know the law, but still can't keep the law, and the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intention, intentions, I obviously need some help. He said, I need some help. He said, I realize that I don't have what it takes. The Apostle Paul. He said, I realize I don't have what it takes to be the man that I'm supposed to be or that I need to be. He said, I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions such as they are don't result in the actions that I wish to take. He says, something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the best of me every single time. He says, it happens to me so regularly that it's predictable. In other words, Paul says, it's like I know when I'm going to fail. He said, then the moment I decide to do good, he said, sin is always there to trip me up. He said, but I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in the delight. He said, there's parts of me that covertly rebel and just when I least expect it, they will take charge. You see, Paul understood that we are constantly in a warfare of the spirit warring against the flesh. You see, your flesh and my flesh don't want to do the things that God is calling us to do. Your flesh and my flesh find that the word of God in keeping the word of God at some times and some points is even difficult. Our flesh struggles against the spirit and the spirit war against the flesh, of course. Paul is identifying that. He said, I've tried everything and absolutely nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything? Thing for me. Isn't that the real question, said Paul? And then Paul says, here's the answer. He says, thank God it's Jesus Christ and he can and he does help me in spite of my failures. He said he acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled aside by the influence of sin and I end up doing something totally different. Now what Paul was not saying that, well I have, he was, because he actually came back and rebuked the church at a later date, the, a church that taught, well the more, I, more, more sin I have, the more grace of God there is, that, 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 that God doesn't expect me to do anything to consecrate myself. That's all what Paul's teaching at all. But what Paul is realizing, what Paul is relating to is the war between the flesh and the spirit is always going on. It's always happening. We are always subject to fail but but Paul is saying in spite of myself Paul was frustrated with himself can you tell that Paul was Paul was upset with himself but he said but I do know an answer he said and that answer is Jesus Christ and he said in spite of the failures of myself in spite of the elements that keep dragging me down he said I know that Jesus Christ is the answer for all of my failures and all of my shortcomings and 
in all of my errors and all of my mistakes, I know that Jesus is my answer. And you and I in this place this morning and those of you watching by, by, by live media and those of you listening to Extreme Voice Radio, I want you to know in spite of our worst that God still gave His best and His name is Jesus and the best will prevail over our worst and we can have victory in Jesus because He is our Lord and our Savior. What, what happens with failure because the struggle is real? That was Romans chapter 7, by the way. What, what happens is making the best of our worst situation. That's what Paul was talking about. How do I make the best of my worst situation? You see, failure for us, failure spiritually is a descent that we have a hard time dealing with. But let me tell you something. Fail, failure, failure cannot, failure's not always bad. In fact, you've, I think you've heard me say this before, that, that, that Babe Ruth, is, has his record, if you look at his record the, uh, of home runs, he struck out multiple times more than he ever hit home runs. But the Babe didn't quit batting just because he struck out at his last bat. Thomas Edison failed more than he succeeded as an inventor. Alexander Graham Bell failed more as an inventor than he succeeded. You and I may have had more failures than seemingly than what we have had successes spiritually. But let me tell you, that is no reason to quit because failures can serve a good purpose for us because every time one of those inventors, every time that the babe stood up to the plate to bat and he struck out, we can learn from every failure that occurs in our life. And our failure, let me tell you, failures are a good ego buster. It is, see, and, and if anything, if anything prohibits us from getting what we need from God, it is our, our own self ego. When we begin to think that we are somebody, or we, when we've got all our ducks in a row, or we've reached a, a spiritual plateau where we've got it all together and we, we know what's going on, and the, the Bible specifically says for us to, to be alert and to be aware because whenever a man thinks he stands because that's when he's going to fall. Listen, failure is a good ego buster. And, and, and when our ego is busted, when our ego is broken, then we see the need of Jesus. Listen, if Paul could have handled everything, if Paul could have dealt with everything, if Paul had such self-control that he never had a failure in his life, would he have made that statement that at the end of that, uh, that excerpt from Romans chapter 7 where he said, I, I can't handle it all, I can't fix it all, but I do know one person that can. And he says, Jesus is that person person. Listen, it's when our ego is broken. It's when our ego is destroyed. It's when our self-sufficient attitude is broken through failure that we can look at Jesus Christ and we can say, Lord, I have failed you miserably. Lord, I can't do this on my own. Lord, I can't live it without you. I can't even walk without you holding my hand. It is in that moment that we go to Jesus and we look to him with all manner of dependence and he comes down and he lifts us up out out of the shadows of failure and he sets our feet on higher ground. I'll tell you what, I don't know about you all, but I felt some preach coming on since Monday and I believe God is breaking the yokes of failure in some people's lives this morning and he is releasing people from out of the bondage of your failures. So allowing weakness and afflictions to be less of an inter interruption and more than an invitation is what I'm urging you to do. Your weaknesses, your failures, sometimes we allow our weaknesses. Can I, can I tell you a story? Can I tell you a story about pastor? i tell you what. I wore my new Barney coat this morning. Went to belt. Sister Sarah had to go see Miss Elaine and buy her all some of that some of that Clinique this week, you know, and, and uh, that's what I bought her for her birthday was a belt gift card, so she's going to go buy her some makeup and, and all like that. And while, while Elaine is 
doing all that. I'm over there looking at the 70% off rack at Belk's. 20 bucks. What a deal. Got me a Barney jacket. But it's a little bit warm for this corduroy this morning. But we begin to make the best of our bad decisions. And as, let, let, me, let me tell you something. When I got saved, I, I grew up first cousin to the Catholics. I grew up Episcopalian. I went to a movie where they had the old reel-to-reel -reel movie projector in the church, and that thing was sitting in the back of that Assembly of God church, and it was sitting there, you know, the whole time the movie's running. And I watched this movie. It's called On the Road to Armageddon. And I didn't know what I didn't know nothing about I didn't know nothing about no Holy Ghost. I didn't know nothing about getting saved. I didn't even know what sa getting saved was. I didn't know none of that stuff because I hadn't been exposed to all that. I was exposed to a prayer book and sprinkling babies and all like that. And I love my Episcopalian friends and all like that. And and, and you know and, and the Holy Spirit's begin to move amongst the Epis Episcopalian church. So no offense to them, but I just didn't know nothing. But when I go and I watch that movie on that big reel-to-reel -reel projector, and, and man, I, I just watched this movie and the blood running to the horse's bridle and all that and this on the road to Armageddon, and I thought, man, I don't want to die and I don't want to go to hell. So I went up to the altar. I didn't have no idea what was going on. I just went up to the altar and I was crying and everybody told me I got saved and, and I, I, you know, I guess I did get saved. Can't say that I didn't get saved. I guess I did get saved. But, but then, you know, and then I go back to school. I was in high school. I was in uh, probably about the ninth or tenth grade at that time. And I, I went to school the next morning and we was in the gym and we got playing rough and rowdy intramural basketball and somebody threw a basketball at me, jammed my fingers up. And, and when they did, I want to tell you what happened to me. I cussed a blue streak. I'm talking about a big blue streak. And in my mind, in my thinking, my unlearned mind and my unlearned thinking, I, I, just, I just, at that moment, I thought, I don't have anything. I really didn't get saved. If I got saved, I just lost it all just right then, within 24 hours. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying we should be cussing Christians, Okay. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I don't condone that at all in that sense. But, but at the same time, I want to say this to you. I had to learn a lesson. I, le I learned a lesson, but, but I didn't learn it. It took me a long time to learn it because, you see, it took me about three years before I really came back and really dedicated my life to the Lord. Because I felt like that, that there was a demand of perfection upon my life that I couldn't do and I couldn't keep. And, and I, allowed, I allowed my weakness to become an interruption in my spiritual life rather than an invitation to grow. But you see, my invitation to grow was this. My invitation to grow was this. It was to, I should have sought God. I should, listen, you want to know why pastor is so, so adamant about discipling and about learning and about teaching and training and, and all like that and why I wanted to have life groups and why I want all of you all to be in life groups. This is it. I didn't have anybody to teach me when I first got saved. There's some of you maybe sitting in this room, you may have been saved 20, 30, or 40 years and you'd never been taught. We need to be taught the learn of God, Word of God. We need to learn the Word of God. I, I, I want to tell you, I, I, I realize that, that in that moment now, I, I, was, I, was really, I was really unlearned and ignorant, if you would, because I thought automatically I just lost everything I had just got the night before at that film. But I really, what I should have done was went to somebody and talked to somebody and said, I really messed up. I said a lot of, a lot of bad words this morning before school started. And what I needed was some, some sane man or woman of God to put their heart, arm around me and say to me, listen, you got to realize you're growing in the Lord and we're going to pray with you and you're going to grow and you're going to increase and, and you've got to give yourself some time. That's what I wish I'd have had, but I didn't have that. So this morning, I want you to not allow your weakness to be an interruption. I want your weakness to be an invitation. The Lord told Paul this, or Paul told this to the church at Corinth, I should say. He said, my power is made perfect in weakness, speaking the word of the Lord. 
You see, it's in our weakness when the, when the, pow, when the power of the Lord is, is really edified. That's when Jesus is really exalt, exalted. You see, it's, it's, when, it's when you and I fail, but, but we can go through and, and experience restoration and the Lord lifts us up out of the shadows of failure and, and the Lord raises us up to another level. Listen, that, that's, when, that's when the glory of the Lord is on display. When, when you and I, when we go out and we, we live our lives and we depict our lives like we got it all together, we don't have any problems, we don't have any errors, we never make any mistakes. When we present ourselves in that way, we're presenting ourselves that we don't even need God to the world because we got it all together. But the reality of it is when we can come to the place where we can say, I have weaknesses, I have failures, I have problems in my life, I have difficulties in my life. And, I just like, and that's exactly what Paul did in Romans chapter 7. And but we can say, in spite of my failures, in spite of my shortcomings, that Jesus meets the needs of my life. And it's not because of who I am or what I can do, but it's because of Jesus inside of me that I am who I am. And I carry the testimony of his love and his righteousness and not of that of my own. So weakness is not our goal. But even though it's not our goal, it often will drive us to our strength. Our weakness shouldn't define us, shouldn't define us at all. But if we're not careful, how we respond to our weaknesses will become our identity. Are you with me? Our weaknesses shouldn't define us, but if we're not really guarded, we're not really careful, our weaknesses will become our identity. It's like the story of the little train. I think I can, I think I can. If the little train never thought he could, he never would have made it across that hill. And I, I noted this in my, in, my, in my points. The roughest, oftentimes the roughest roads of life, the roughest roads that we go down in life, the roughest thing, the, the thing that you have the hardest time dealing with in life will lead you to the most inspiring places. Sometimes the roughest road, and I, I've never been on the trails up here. I've just been there to trailheads. One of these days, I'm going to find me some someplace to rip me a side by side, and I don't take I don't take Sister Sarah for a ride. But I've been told some of the roughest trails that you can get on will take you to the most beautiful places. That's up here in these mountains. Sometimes the roughest. Most extreme, difficult roads of life will take us to the most beautiful places, spiritually speaking, that we can find. You see, God's not left helpless when our lives are in ruin. But God arises out of the ashes of ruins and he makes something glorious and wonderful out of us. So don't give up. Don't give up the fight. Don't give it up. We can't afford to give up. Because the person that gives up will never stand a chance to win. <laughs> Samson was enslaved. He was blinded. And I'll just tell you the truth. Samson, no doubt, was very ashamed of himself. A mighty man now grinding at the mill like he was a pack horse or a mule. But Samson grew stronger every day. Read the story. His hair, the locks of his hair begin to grow. The significant part of his Nazarite vow. And with every turn of that grinding wheel, with every revolution that he made, every time there was a little bit more strength coming back into Samson. And Samson's about to make a comeback. Comebacks are pretty sweet. Do you know it? Some of you watched the national championship, the college football championship a few weeks ago. Big comeback. Some of the playoffs, big comeback. I didn't watch the Super Bowl last week. I had my own personal convictions about that. 
but it sounded to me, what a little bit I heard about it, it sounded to me like the eagles made a comeback. You know, y'all, y'all, you know, y'all know my, you know, you know my main man, Kyle Busch, won the NASCAR championship. He, that was his first one year before last. He you knows he's gonna win his next one this year. But he won that one year before last because he made a bit, and he made a big comeback that made it all the sweeter. You know, comeback, comebacks make it really sweet. Did you know it? You know, a team gets out and dominates and stays, you know, you know, way ahead, two or three touchdowns ahead the whole game. What, that, what happens, you get boring, it gets boring and you turn the channel or you turn it off. Same guy, I went to Charlotte to a race one time back years ago and Mark Martin led almost every lap of the race. There was literally people that sat, he lapped all but like two cars in the field. There's people literally sat there in the grandstands and went to sleep. But, but, but you let somebody come from behind to win. And, and it makes the victory the, a, a whole lot sweeter. And it makes it a whole lot better. And let me tell you, it's not possible to have a comeback if we never get behind. Are you with me? Sometimes in our walk with God, it seems like we get behind. Sometimes in our walk with God, it seems like we have a, a, a system failure. Sometimes in our walk with God, we'll have a flat tire. Sometimes in our walk with God, we'll have a drop pass. Sometimes in, 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 in our walk with God, we will slice one into the lake. Sometimes in our walk with God, we will get behind. But let me tell you, when we go to Jesus and, we, and he brings us back, victorious. Listen, the victory is so much sweeter when we come back after a failure. So this morning, don't be don't be discouraged about your failures. Don't be discouraged about your shortcomings. Don't be discouraged about what you have not been able to accomplish or what you've not been able to do. I'm not a tremendous movie watcher. There's now I, I was I, I do like cowboy movies. And last night I was watching a Clint Eastwood movie, but the clock wouldn't allow me to finish watching it. I already seen it who knows how many times. You know, the outlaw Jesse Wells. I love I like the cowboy movies. There's a few others I like here and there. I don't I don't like these old love story movies. You know, I get enough hallmark on that anyway. And I'll tell you, I've seen all of these, but I haven't seen them. But I can remember as a, a young child that I was, in 1976, there was a movie came out that was called Rocky. And Rocky was just a, it was a movie wander of sorts. And there was more sequels and more sequels, and I didn't get to see them all, and and, uh, and, and all like that, but, but Rocky Six, Rocky Six, the movie. Rocky is now a retired boxer. He's over 60 years old in Rocky Six. His wife, Adrian, Adrian has died. Rocky's a devastated man. In his life, he's older now, but there's a challenge. Rocky Balboa challenges the reigning world champion, a guy called Mason the Lion Dixon, a young guy, a world champion boxer. This aged man is considered to lose the fight and go out early. All odds are against Rocky. But Frankie if, or Scott, somebody, one of you guys, bring the lights down for me. I want you to watch this little clip, just about a minute and a half. I want you to watch this, inter, this, this conversation between Rocky Balboa and Mason the Lion Dixon just before, just hours before they get ready to fight their world champion fight. Imagine you trying to clean this place? <laughs> no, seriously. My boy. All right, you guys, uh, I'll catch up with you all later, okay? Robert, why don't you hang with me? How you doing, champ? I'm good. Yo, man, there's no reason for neither one of us to get hurt in this fight. Not 
do my best to carry you. Make sure you save face. There'd be no embarrassment. But I promise you, if you try to press me, you hit me, you hurt me, you hit me low, cheap shot me, I'll get you out of there. You know, uh, a lot of people come to Vegas to lose. I did. It's already over. We've done some over until it's over. What's that from, the 80s? It's probably in the 70s. Just remember what I said. Hey, yo, champ. Yo, ain't you a little scared? I don't get scared. You know, I think you try a little harder when you're scared. This is uh, what has worked for me. <laughs> scared, I ain't scared. Oh, yeah, you ain't scared of me. Come on, let's see what you got. Come on. Okay, stop. <laughs> hey, don't hit me, I'm brittle. All right, bring the lights back up. Rocky said to his opponent, the guy that's supposed to win at all odds, it's not over till it's over. You know, if you watch this movie, and in this movie, let me tell you a little bit what happens. They go into the fight. And the lion beats Rocky unmercifully. Round after round, he beats, just beats, literally physically beats Rocky. The final round... He beats Rocky down on the mat. A bleeding 60-year-old man keeps climbing back up. And though Rocky never knocked Mason, the line Dixon, out, what did happen is it came down to, the fight comes down to a split decision. And as the judges were announcing their decisions and Mason, the line Dixon, the young guy, was counting victory already. You got this. You won this. They gave the score of the final judge. And as they gave the score of the final judge, and the announcer begins his spiel, and the, the new world champion is none other than and Mason the line Dixon's already cheering. He's smiling until the words Rocky Balboa are announced. In a post-fight interview, the, the reporters, the sports announcers, go up and start interviewing Dixon, and they begin to ask him questions. And, and he says things like, you know, you can't never count these old guys out. But they said, do you have any final words? Mason the line Dixon looked at that reporter, looked at the camera, spoke into the microphone, and he said, the only thing I got to say is, it's not over till it's over. And so is our walk of faith. So is our walk of faith. So is our experience with God. God says he identifies himself as Alpha, Omega, beginning, ending, the author, and the finisher of our faith. And I, whatever, we, whatever happens in our life, whatever we go through, whatever you've been through, whatever is going on in your life right now, I've got news for you. It's not over until it is over. Paul told the church at Philippi, he said, I'm going to keep praying for you because he that began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. God did not call you. He did not call me. He did not save me. He did not save you in order that we may just fail. But he has called us that we may continue on until that day of completion, until that day that he has set aside. But we can't quit. We've got to keep going. We've got to keep pressing in in spite of our failures. 
In spite of our fallacies, in spite of our mistakes, we need some more comebacks. We need some more revivals. We need some more restitution to take place in our lives with God. And that will happen because God, God told us to forgive 70 times 7 in one day and he's not going to ask us to do something that he wouldn't do or couldn't do himself. And he's a God of mercy and he's a God of forgiveness and he's a for God of love. And certainly, I'm not saying that he, he does it for, for those that are so spiritually inclined. Certainly, he doesn't say that we got a license to go out and live our life, you know, in, in a some slipshod life. But, but, but when we fail and when we stumble and we fall and when we struggle with weaknesses, understand this, that God is our restorer. And he will lift us up. And he has a plan for you and he has a plan for me. In fact, he said this through his prophet Jeremiah. He said, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. At the end of Paul's road, Paul said this, Paul said, I fought a good fight. You see those boxing gloves. We're forevermore going to be in a fight. The fight is never going to end. The fight is never going to cease until the Lord comes and calls us out, whether it's by death or it's by the rapture of the church. The fight is never going to end. But Paul said, I I finished my fight. I completed the course that was given me to run. He, and and he, he gets up off the mat time and time again. And he lets God fight his fights for him. And you know what? That's part of our struggle. Because we take ownership of the fight. We take ownership of the, str- the struggle. We, we take ownership. We say, I've got an addiction. Or we'll say, I've got this problem. Or I've got this weakness. And we begin to take ownership of all of our stuff instead of giving it to God. But when we begin to give it to Him. And we'll be like Paul was in that seventh chapter of Romans. We'll say, these things I can't do. But I do have one that can do it for me. Jesus. Jesus. As we prepare to go to prayer here in just a moment, I want to tell you, I want to tell you a little story about I, I, I have been literally, I will say I've been the size. I have been this height, the height that I am right now. I have been this height since I was in the fifth grade of school. Okay? I grew. I was a I was a brute in elementary school. And then to starting into middle school. Then I just stopped growing. Couldn't play, couldn't run the backfield in, in little league football because I, I weighed too much. And I just quit growing. So I've been this I, all through high school, you know, but nobody ever told me I was this short until after I got out of high school. I didn't realize it. But I, I, I ran around, I ran around with a couple guys, and one of them's still a very dear friend of mine today. Well, they're both my friends, but I ran around a couple guys. Steve and Tony and Steve and Tony Steve right now probably weighs whew, Lord Steve probably weighs about 350 pounds I mean he's a big old boy and Tony Tony big old boy too and and and, and I used to run around with those guys and go and, and you know what I you know we just like most young boys I we I we got in trouble it was always nice to have my big buddies with me when I got in trouble I want you to know it was I could all I I did it was just like I always could depend on them to be there. Maybe you had to, maybe you were the buddy, maybe you have a circumstance like that too yourself. But I want to tell you something. I've got I've got a friend, a buddy, that sticks closer than a brother. 
I've got somebody that no matter no matter how bad it gets, no matter how hard how hard it is, no matter how miserably I fail, no matter what goes on in my life, I've got somebody that hangs with me. He he doesn't get mad at me because I messed up. He doesn't ditch me because I messed up. He is my friend. He is Jesus. He is with me in whatever I go through. He is with me. And he's with you too. I want you to bow your heads for a minute. Heads bowed and eyes closed. And I'm sitting here in this room this morning. And if you're watching by, if you're watching by Facebook Live, and maybe, maybe this message has spoke to you. If you're listening by radio, maybe it spoke to you. But I want to ask you something in this, in particular in the room here. If you're in this room and you're not saved, let me tell you something. You, you, you're not under the protection of your big brother. You're not under the ultimate protection that he can bring you if you're not saved. If you're in this room today and you're unsaved or, or, or maybe you've wandered far away from God. Maybe, maybe, you're, maybe you haven't broke relationship with Him but you know you're wandering far away from Him. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand without any embarrassment? I'm not calling you out but just help me to know how to pray. Will you raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to be saved or I need, I need to be renewed. Is there anybody in this room? Is there one in this place then? Is there one in this place that would say, Pastor, I am struggling with my weaknesses. I am struggling overcoming my failures. I'm struggling. Maybe your, maybe your weakness is unbelief. Maybe your weakness is an addiction. Maybe your weakness is, it could be any, any type. Maybe, you're, maybe, it's, your, maybe it's your temperament. Maybe, maybe, maybe you, uh, you don't have self-control. It could be all kinds, all sorts of things. But you're in this place right now and you're struggling to keep certain parts of your life in tow. You're struggling and, and you, feel, you feel unworthy because of those things. You feel unworthy because you know you fail so often, so many times, just like Paul. If that's you in this room and you're struggling with some things in your life right now, would you, without, again, without embarrassment, without any manipulation, would you slip up your hand and just say, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. A number of hands have gone up. We're going to say goodbye to our Facebook audience out of respect for those that would like to come forth and pray this morning. So thank you guys for joining us today. But those of you that raised your hand and in a spe and in those that didn't.